one of the most egregious things that was happening at the time was this narrative that the open to work banner was explain what the open to work banner is just for anyone who doesn't who's maybe not seen it what is the open to work banner and this is what's even interesting is that there are two open to work features on linkedin and the one that got all the attention was the open to work banner that goes around your profile picture the green banner indicates a visual indicator to everyone using linkedin that you are open to work there is other open to work functionality which is only visible to recruiters and i'll get to that but the um open to work banner folks that are not recruiters uh, and have never been recruiters, but were producing clickbaity content, were starting to create this narrative that the open to work banner made you look desperate or that it was counterproductive to finding a job. And that is just flat out untrue. And so I felt the need to start to write content that explained what is actually happening. And so specifically for the open to work functionality. So the LinkedIn product managers in response to the first wave of layoffs in 2021 built two new pieces of functionality. They allowed you as a user of the platform to privately indicate to recruiters that you are open to hearing about new opportunities. They also created a feature where you could have a visual cue that would show everybody on LinkedIn that you were open to work. And one of the many things that I love about LinkedIn is that it's so data-driven. LinkedIn has more than a billion members worldwide. And as a result, they get very large data sets and can tell, uh, can make very clear inferences from that data. And... So it's, and I always go to the data when I'm correcting things or trying to make a point on LinkedIn. And platform wide, LinkedIn can show that if you are, if you privately indicate to recruiters that you are open to work, on average, users that do that receive 40% more in mails from recruiters than folks that don't. And for the open to work banner, again, platform wide across the all billion users, people that use the open to work banner see a further 20% uplift, not just wow. in messages from recruiters, but in messages from folks across the platform. Wow. And for most users, you would want both. You want to hear from recruiters, obviously, because they're more likely to mm. connect you to jobs, but most job seekers You also want to hear from other people who can connect you to opportunity, whether it's hiring managers or peers of hiring managers. You definitely want both sets of uplift. The only reason you wouldn't use the visual open to work banner is if you are currently in a job and you don't want your employer to know that you're looking elsewhere, which is is why they have the discrete option. But this narrative that either or or the visual banner is bad for Mm. you is just flat out wrong. Yeah, it seems to think people seem to think it was desperate, um, which I also think is, you know, quite disparaging and and really lacks a level of empathy to what people are going through. And, and you know, we'll talk about kind of the, the recruiting process and what recruiters do and don't look at and stuff like that. But I also think it, look, it looks towards a real antiquated way of thinking that is just not consistent with the last four years of 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 hiring where we've seen mass layoffs uh, around the world and then mass rehirings. And so people do have gaps and people are like, there are more people looking for work now in the tech space than there ever has been, you know, really. And so, uh, especially in the recruiting space. And so the idea that, that kind of we're labeling those people as desperate is just lacking a real deep level of empathy. And so I guess just to kind of summarize, you know, we, we kind of, felt that this was one of the best examples out there of, of this signal to noise problem. We had people out there saying that the green banner was desperate, really prominent um, you know, news outlets as well, picking this up and talking about this and writing about this uh, in, in mainstream media. I wanted to, and really where when you, what you're saying and what I'm hearing is that the data indicates that not only is uh, that this is 
completely untrue and actually is is actively beneficial and, and can increase the likelihood of you getting kind of the right message into your inbox by 60% um, based on the data that LinkedIn, you know, are published. I mean, it's, I think it's as good of an example as any, as I could say, to kind of what we want people to take away from this podcast. I think, um, but, and feel free to add anything, but what, when you think about the kind of key pieces of, let's say, misinformation or, or myths, what are the biggest myths that like really stand out to you um, that you'd like, you know, first episode out there, you really want people to walk away with open to work banner is, you know, use the open to work banner. It's not desperate. It's going to increase the likelihood of your conversations. What are kind of potentially two more that really stand out to you that you'd like to dispel? So a hill that I will die on is that AI and bots <laughs> are not <laughs> running. Ring the bell. The We've said net. AI. It took us yeah. took us a little bit of time, but we got there. <laughs> we got there. The ATS, the applicant tracking system, is the very very basic functionality, very, very basic technology that has very, very limited functionality that recruiting teams use to manage inbound applications and outbound communication. That's all that it does. Many of the ATSs still in use are up to 20 years old. And I won't get super specific, but I've already talked about some of the Fortune 500 companies where I've worked and the tech stacks there are 20 years old. Uh, and so if some of the richest companies in the world do not have AI yeah. in their tech stack, it's just not a thing yet. And bugbear number one, bugbear number two, so much of what people are saying is AI is not AI. It is automation. There is mm -hmm. automation, there are algorithms, and then there's AI. And mm -hmm. AI is very, very new, less than a year old at commercial scale. And it is not yet deployed anywhere inside an ATS. It very likely yeah. will be in the future, but we're some ways from that. And this narrative that you have to beat the ATS and beat the bots is, again, completely erroneous and has been created by people that are trying to sell you something i.e. CV, CV or resume rewriting services or coaching. There's no, there's no bot to be. Yeah. Yeah. There might be in a few years, but there isn't yet. Yeah. And I think that's the key, right? Like the, the, the narrative seems to be, and it really has, uh, I've, I've reviewed lots of CVs over the past kind of six months that you're having to kind of gain the ATS by building a CV that is AI compatible and ATS compatible. And like, there's a difference between being ATS compatible and AI compatible. If you had to say something away, every CV that you put into an ATS should be in a PDF format. Anything more than that isn't necessary uh, and it probably will struggle to read. Uh, but there's not a computer on the other side of it. And we have seen, so I've, I've worked with and reviewed many of the small, like many of the more, more cutting edge um, vendors out there in inverted commas that, that are going to be used by smaller businesses. And you've and, and we've also both worked with some of the largest vendors out there like Workday and Taleo and stuff like, you know, and, and significant, significant systems. And at best, they're giving a, a rating system. Maybe I've seen that at, uh, in smart recruiters has a, has a rating system. Um, but it's not stack racking, stack racking, um, candidates at all. Um, and in most companies in the US, they will deem that rating system to be non-compliant with a variety of different, um, diversity and inclusion laws as well. And so the idea that a computer is reviewing, reviewing your, your kind of CV before a human is, is, is just, yeah, is, is untrue from every single data point. And I've asked many, many people this and I, I've never seen, um, seen it happen to date. Um, so when you're building your CV, build it for a human um, and make sure that the ATS, this CRM, that this kind of database can hold the, the, the information in a PDF format. And that's the most likely way of gaming the ATS. Yes. A human being is reviewing your resume. Or not. The truth is in companies that are, are operating in a, res, a less regulated environment, they will not have the pressure to look at every single resume. And so, you're, you know, the, the reality is in a market like yeah. this that you, your, your resume might never get seen. 
but he could get mass rejected potentially at the end of a, at the end of a process. And that's probably the, the probably the two circumstances. And we'll talk about this all in more detail in the future, giving you a little taster here. But there's probably two circumstances where your ATS, your, your CV is not being reviewed by a person. One is because you probably, you potentially have ticked a box that has said that you require a visa relocation, um, or something like that, something to that effect that you, you've gone through a form and you've, you've missed some of the kind of must have requirements within the form that they've asked, or, um, you've been mass rejected because they've selected another candidate or closed the role. And those are really the only two times that you'll likely not have a human visit, you know, use their own eyeballs to review your, view your CV. So we're to summarize, um, you know, what, what people should be kind of taking away from this first first episode in this discussion around kind of the, the, the noise that's on the market at the moment, I guess, seems like num- number one is to the best of our knowledge, there is no AI at scale around the world reviewing um, CVs at application stage and screening you out at application stage. Um, we are yet to be proven wrong about this. Um, I, mean, I would love for people to write in if they've, if they've heard. Um, so but the best thing you can do when you're applying is CV um, it being in the PDF format. Um, the open to work banner has been, uh, it sounds like that is, um, definitely use it if you're open to work or if you, you know, be inclined to use it. The data is suggesting that, um, it's better for, it's going to increase your likelihood of getting into the right conversation for your next job uh, and increase the number of people who are going to reach out to you potentially as well. And then the third would be, you've got to be in it to win it, right? Don't let the number of, and the volume of applicants that might be present on LinkedIn dissuade you from, from applying. 100%. And I, we'll we'll have a whole episode on applying and, each of and, and channel, <laughs> yeah. but applying online is still table stakes. There are more things that you can do now to mm. signal to noise in your favor, but it still starts with submitting your application. And yeah. these narratives that are out there saying don't apply online, that's not helpful because yeah. year over year, that's how 50% of jobs get filled inside organizations. Fully 50% of jobs across yeah. the enterprise are filled by people applying. Yep, exactly. 